You're watching the new Stack Makers, a podcast for people who develop, deploy, and manage at scale software. For more information and articles about at scale technologies, please visit thenewstack.io. Now enjoy the show. Since its inception, Amazon Web Services, AWS, has been the best place for customers to build and run open source software in the cloud. AWS is proud to support open source projects, foundations, and partners. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another On the Road episode of the New Stack Makers. I'm your host, Heather Joslin of, of the New Stack, and we're coming to you from the floor of QCon plus Cloud Native Con North America here in Chicago, that toddling town. And uh, today we're going to talk about, well, what else would you talk about at, at KubeCon? But uh, Kubernetes, that little open source container orchestrator that could. Um, and we're going to talk uh, about uh, specifically how Amazon Web Services, or AWS to its friends, has uh, supported um, and invested in, in Kubernetes and open source projects around Kubernetes. And uh, we're going to talk about its work specifically on some related tools like Kubelet and Container. And we're going to learn what's new with Carpenter, with a K, uh, a Kubernetes cluster out autoscaler built with AWS. And for our discussion today, we're joined by two folks from AWS. First, Jonathan Innes. Hi, Jonathan. Hey, how's it going? Um, Jonathan, tell me a little bit, bit about yourself and what you do at AWS. Yeah, so I'm a, a software engineer on the um, EKS team at AWS and uh, maintainer in the Carpenter project. Uh, yeah, Ex super excited to be here. Excellent. And uh, we're also joined by Todd Neal. Hi, Todd. Hey, how are you doing? Todd, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do at AWS. Yeah, sure. Um, so I've been at AWS for about two years. I've uh, worked on the uh, Carpenter project. also do some upstream work in a Signode and then uh, just general work in a EKS compute org. Great, great. Um, before we begin, I just want to thank AWS for sponsoring this conversation. And let's get going. Um, so a little bit of... Uh, let's give a little bit of background. Um, a year ago, my TNS colleague, Job Jackson, uh, spoke to Jay Pipes, who was then your colleague at AWS. And uh, Jay said that at the time, uh, Amazon was working on a mirror of the Kubernetes assets that are hosted on the Google Cloud Platform in order to eliminate Google egress costs, which usually are borne by the CNCF. Um, can you update us on that situation and how Amazon is investing in, in yeah, the yes, Kubernetes project more general. Yeah, so uh, it started last year at KubeCon North America. Uh, uh, at that point, AWS announced that they were donating $3 million in uh, cloud credits to the mm -hmm. CNCF. And then there was a uh, project that was stood up by Sid Cates Infra. Um, so one of my colleagues, Dims, is one of the co-chairs of Sid Cates Infra, and they mm -hmm. stood up the registry, registry.cates.io. Um, so that registry basically looks at where the requests for images is uh, coming from and then redirects it to the cloud provider um, that is sort of closest to that location. So if you're coming from the Google Cloud, you'll actually be pulling images from Google servers. If you're coming from an AWS, uh, an AWS cloud, you'll be pulling images from S3 directly. So that way you can avoid the uh, egress, costs, uh, egress costs and it basically it can be expanded to future cloud providers if they want to get interested. Uh, and that is sort of a, a good way to reduce that egress cost. Um, in addition, there's like a large community effort to once that registry was stood up to mm -hmm. basically go update all of the documentation, all the repositories, and point all of the Kubernetes users to this new registry so that they'll actually start pulling images from this new location. Mm -hmm. um, that basically everyone in the community was involved. There were notifications everywhere, all over the Kubernetes side, trying to get people to use this new registry. And then sort of most recently in June, uh, Amazon Elastic Container Registry uh, added a new feature to act as a pull-through uh, pull through cache for mm -hmm. registry.cates.io to sort of further reduce the uh, egress cost. And then the requests don't even get to registry.cates.io, they'll, they'll be cached and served directly from the ECR. Great, so that, so that project is gone quite a ways in the last year. Oh yes, yeah. yeah. Basically from, uh, from sort of announced to uh, full production and the old registry being deprecated and yeah, um, it's greatly reduced the costs that were being borne by Google and uh, sort of, uh, yeah, people are pulling from it sort of as we speak. That's great, that's great. Um, I mentioned a couple of open source projects in, in my introduction. Um, we talked about, uh, mentioned Kubelet, which is the primary node agent that runs on each node in a Kubernetes cluster. I have that right, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, Containered, which manages the container runtime. How has AWS been involved in each of these projects? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so Kubelet is the you know the primary node agent for Kubernetes. It's running on you know every uh, Kubernetes node out there. Um, so we uh, in AWS we contribute to Kubelet by doing things by deflaking tests. Uh, we've done some work to uh, make it uh, basically extend the end-to-end -end test to run on uh, Amazon Clouds, using up some of those uh, cloud credits that were donated last year. And in particular, working on like the ARM64 um, test, ensuring that it works there and is tested there. Um, I've contributed some work myself to the sidecar feature, which is coming out in beta in uh, 129. I'll be speaking about that tomorrow with uh, one of my uh, sort of colleagues, uh, Sergey uh, Candela from Google, who also uh, did some of the work there. And uh, in ContainerD, um, so first off, I have to mention Phil Estes, who's an AWS principal engineer. Um, he does an awful lot of work for ContainerD. He's a maintainer there. Uh, he's all over the repository, reviewing, mentoring, just sort of uh, helping to lead that effort on ContainerD. It sounds like there's a a, a real um, community kind of mm -hmm. spirit in, the, in this project. Yeah, yeah. People from different uh, different companies, different organizations, uh, students. Everyone just sort of you know pitching in as a community to uh, to just sort of move these projects along. Um, yeah. You look like you were gonna. You want to say something? No, no, nothing specific. I was, <laughs> I was just thinking. There's been there's been uh, Vim's joined our team. I'm trying to think how long ago that was at this point. Yeah. Um, yeah almost two years. Almost. Just, yeah, and I think since Dims has, has joined AWS, it's been there's been a big push and and a, kind of a kind of an initiative around like really pushing people to be more active in, in the open source community and yeah. and yeah contribute a lot more to these projects. And I think it's really we're seeing a lot of change happen recently over that. So it's been it's been really exciting. Cool. Um, is there anything new going on in those projects, uh, Kubelet and Container, that you want to highlight, mm -hmm. or, or maybe ask if there's um, specific parts of the, that project you, you might want to ask for con contributions, ask our audience for contributions to. Oh yeah, so uh, for Kubelet, which is part of the Signal project, um, if you're interested in contributing, there are uh, working groups, uh, particularly this uh, Signal CI group where we go over test failures and try to deflake tests and just sort of improve reliability of Kubelet. Um, if you're uh, if you're a user and just want to remain a user, the sidecar feature is brand new in 129. It'll be enabled by default, so you can use sidecar. So I encourage everyone to use that. Provide us feedback as it goes to GA. It, the feature may evolve some. So really interested in sort of uh, how they may want changes, particularly in like a container termination order. And uh, yeah, so uh, container D, um, it's actually just released a 2.0 uh, pre-release. It's quickly approaching the 2.0 milestone, so congratulations to that team as they're sort of approaching that uh, that uh, that large milestone there. But yeah, it's just uh, just sort of, uh, yeah, really happy to have all the community working together on these two projects, and uh, yeah. Um, a couple of years ago, Carpenter was introduced by AWS. Uh, what is Carpenter, Jonathan? Yeah, so Carpenter is a Kubernetes node autoscaler, um, so I'd, I'd assume Maybe some people are familiar with the Cluster Autoscaler. Mm -hmm. um, Carpenter was kind of born out of, um, I guess, some customer headaches with some of the details of the Cluster Autoscaler. So um, the Cluster Autoscaler is kind of designed more for uh, hands off a lot of the, I guess, group management of nodes off to a bunch of like the cloud provider specific APIs. Um, so there's a bunch of cloud providers that are implemented with Cluster Autoscaler, and, and you can kind of, there's a plug and play aspect to it where it will it'll scale up nodes that based on the, the groups that you have in those, in the, in the different cloud provider APIs. Um, the problem that, that came out of that kind of configuration was basically um, customers had to create a lot of different groups and for a lot of the different instance types. And for AWS specifically, like we have over 700 instance types, and so uh, customers want a lot of flexibility with which instance types they pick based on the workloads that they specify. And so what we're seeing a lot mm -hmm. from customers is, you know, I have to create a, uh, a managed node group per instance type and maybe per AZ as well, mm -hmm. um, which is a lot of management for anyone to have to do. So yeah. um, that's kind of what Carpenter was born out of. So Carpenter looks at the pinning pods similar to, to Cluster Autoscaler. Um, it looks at your pinning pods and your applications that it's going to launch, and then it, it there's kind of the concept of we call it a node pool, but it's a, it's kind of like a flexible node group in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so you can you can kind of specify requirements on your node pool, and we'll dynamically pick the instance type that we'll launch it in, and we'll also pick the dynamically pick the AZ that we'll launch it in, um, without you really ha having to do a whole lot of configuration. So you can you can specify some details like like taints and some different things that you um, like Kubelet configuration that would you'd specify on the node, the image that it will launch with. Um, but for the most part, like 
it's really minimal configuration. So you just come there, you say, you know, you could have as, as little as one node pool. You just apply a node pool to a cluster, and then you start deploying applications. And if they go pending and they don't schedule to existing nodes, Carpenter will look at all your requirements and, and mm. pick the um, pick the instance types that, that would best fit those applications. And then, um, kind of on top of that, we've not just built like a node cluster auto scaling solution, but we built um, kind of a node lifecycle management solution. So we have, we have deep integration with the cloud providers um, that we currently support. So currently right now we, obviously AWS supports um, Carpenter and then um, just on, I guess yesterday, Azure announced their version, their cloud provider support for Carpenter. So now you can you can oh, run Carpenter on Azure as well, which is which we're super excited about. Oh wow, that's um, And so we have like deep integration with those cloud provider APIs, a little bit deeper than Cluster Autoscaler. And so what that means is that we can, uh, do a lot more node lifecycle management. So for instance, um, we manage node upgrades, um, which is typically handed off to the cloud provider. Because we can manage node upgrades and we have some intelligence about that, mm. um, we can be smart about how we choose to disrupt nodes at certain times. And we have some configuration that you can manage to be able to, to determine like when you want those things to happen. Um, Todd, for instance, was really pivotal in developing the consolidation feature, mm -hmm. which is a mechanism by which we you know, do cost savings for our customers. And customers have absolutely loved that since we implemented it. Um, mm -hmm. It was a big win when we supported uh, scaling up with Carpenter and being able to dynamically select from those 700 instance types on AWS. But yeah. customers have also been really excited to be able to enable, like, enable the flag that enables consolidation. Yeah. And they see like, 30%, 40% cost savings across the board, um, which right. is which is amazing. Yeah. In these days, it's so. It, we're, I mean, we're hearing the word FinOps so uh -huh. much at this at this particular conference, and so many uh, organizations are concerned about their bottom line these days. So obviously, that's that's a big yeah. that's a big win for um, for anyone who's using it. Um, is there anything on the on the roadmap right now, and for either for Carpenter, for for Container D, for people that you you know, that you look for, you know, look, look in the, the I, Yeah, I can, I can touch on Carpenter real quick. Um, so the cloud provider support, multiple cloud provider support has been on our roadmap for a while. Um, we've been working hard with, with Azure on that, um, uh -huh. trying to push, and we're, and we're still trying to push for other cloud providers to implement uh, the Carpenter cloud provider interface as well so that we can start supporting more and more clouds. Mm -hmm. um, so now we're at two, but we're like quickly trying to, to move towards other clouds. I know there's been, there's been a little bit of a murmur in the issues on you know Oracle or GCP, um, and mm. we're, we're still looking for contributors to be able to, to mm. support those other clouds. Um, we are actively, and we've been in the process for about six to eight months now, um, working with SIG Auto Scaling on mm. donating um, the Carpenter Core project, um, which is kind of like the core libraries that, that the Carpenter cloud providers rely on. Mm. Um, donating that to SIG Auto Scaling and donating that effectively to the CNCF, um, mm. and that is like. Impending like very quickly, so which we're super excited about. So we got we got formal approval from the co-chairs of Segato Scaling to um, be donated to the upstream Kubernetes project, um, and so now all that's left is all the detail of like moving the repos and things like that. But that's super exciting. Um, we hear a lot from customers that they're looking for kind of that ag that agnosticism and like the support in the in the community, and so um, that's been that's been really exciting to see happen. Um, we just released beta, I guess, two weeks ago now. Um, which was a huge milestone for the project. We're kind of quickly heading towards stabilization. So um, V1 is also impending. Like we really want to get to stable APIs, and so um, and customers are wanting that and asking for that. And so um, that's on a roadmap, happening you know relatively soon. Um, um, so we're, we're pushing hard for that. Um, yeah, we're just we're really excited. There's a ton of ton of excitement and development going mm -hmm. on in the project right now, and it's it's really exciting. It's great. Yeah. Um, is there anything else new um, that AWS is involved with with regard to Kubernetes and other open source projects that you that you might have mentioned, or do we feel like you covered that right now? So we, so we did recently announce our uh, AWS extended support for Kubernetes. So uh, extended support for clusters. It's in preview now. Uh, that will allow some customers to re remain on a version for a, a longer period of time, sort of push out those cluster upgrades. So it's in preview now. Customers can go check that out. That's a new feature. And they can. And they should go. Where should they go to check that out? So we have, a, I believe, an AWS blog article that sort of explains it. And okay. uh, yeah, we'd be glad to make the link available for anyone that's interested. Yeah. Well, we'll and we'll link to that. Um, you can tell me a little bit about um, working in, in open source at AWS. Like, what kind of, um, uh, what is the, how does the culture sort of um, support 
um, that that work mm. at AWS? Or how, yeah. how do they support yeah. you in that in that work? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so it's uh, it's really part of your task. Um, so uh, you know, we work on lots of different things, and then open source is one of them. Um, and so when there are, there are areas that you know we can make contributions upstream and sort of help out the community, uh, we strive to do that. Um, like in particular, we've uh, we've worked to get some of our internal patches to some of the Kubernetes uh, components pushed back upstream, so that the entire community can uh, contribute. Uh, we have uh, you know, another software, software engineer named Igor that's been involved in some of the cell work for uh, validation, trying to make webhooks uh, safer. So uh, yeah, just sort of all over, like anywhere that we can make a contribution upstream that can sort of help the community out, help help out users across the CNCF. Yeah, we're sort of more than glad to do that. And yeah, and, uh, yeah that's what we uh, try to work yeah. on. Not much to add, honestly. <laughs> that was, that's add. a pretty good answer. <laughs> Not much to add. Well, um, tell me a little bit about like your your own experience with with open source as as as, as engineers. Like, what how, did you have you always been involved in open source, or did your, it, is a part of part of your formation as as you know professionals? Yeah. So I think we were briefly talking about this ahead of this conversation, but this is my first coupon, and um, I was involved in open source uh, for a little while. So I, I I've been at AWS for a little over a year, and before that I was mm -hmm. I was at Microsoft Azure, and uh, at Azure I was working with Flux and. A lot of people know about that project, and that's an open source project by WeaveWorks. And yeah. Um, yeah, just communities in general around open source projects. I mean, it's it's really great to finally see some of these people that I've, I've worked with for a while in, in person and, and see how supportive the community is. I think everyone is really, um, particularly in the Kubernetes community, is really, really open to new contributors and really open to um, people just coming in and, and just Feeling, feeling supported, and I, I think we really want to foster that community at AWS as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think also it, it definitely, it's it's really a huge deal when it comes to um, just multiplying the ability of other projects to like move faster, really, because yeah. we can leverage a lot. I mean, we we have a lot of dependencies on other open source projects. Most most of them being like control runtime and upstream Kubernetes, and a lot of those were you know hours and hours of other contributors really putting in work to to make the Kubernetes experience and building on top of Kubernetes yeah. easier. And yeah. it's really made it, I mean, really easy for you know us to create things like Carpenter where we can we can have a stable um, auto-scaling project that is is you know relatively easy to build and maintain. And I think a lot of that is, I mean, if we had to do it ourselves, it would be it would be a lot harder to maintain. We need yeah. a lot more people to do it. We move much, much slower. Yeah. So it's been really great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about yourself? How did is your yeah, so uh, I guess some uh, first major contributions. Um, I worked on the Go compiler back in the 1.7 days, um, and that was I spent quite a bit of time there, and that kind of really got me introduced to the Go language and using it a lot. And then sort of uh, that was kind of how I transitioned to Kubernetes because a lot of Kubernetes components are written in Go. When I came to AWS, the first thing I worked on was Carpenter, uh, which is built in the open source. And sort of the nice thing about building out in the open is that you get that community feedback immediately. Um, you, we can put up design docs and get community members to comment and say, you know, if they're not contributing code, they're like, hey, this feature doesn't work for me, or I need this feature to be changed slightly, or I need a brand new feature. And that, that sort of rapid cycle of feedback to, hey, we're writing code, can you try this out? Does it, does it solve your problem? And that's just that it's really sort of a, just a great development model for, uh, for building software. It's kind of like it kind of mimics also I would think the the feedback loop that mm -hmm. that businesses want you know with customers you know like to, to that's that's rapid, been a yeah it's been a big feedback, win for us rap, with with Carpenter because it's yeah. it's allowed us to that's why we've been in alpha for so long yeah. like it's really allowed us to get a lot of feedback from from customers and users and understand their use cases a little bit better so that we don't because we don't want to stabilize our APIs too quickly and then we can't change them so <laughs> it's given us a lot of you know time to be able to get feedback from customers and understand exactly you know what they need what they want and you build it and then see if it works for them and if it doesn't work for them then we hear about it real fast and then we <laughs> fix it and keep iterating yeah 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 all right, well, um, I think that's a good place to, to wrap it up. So uh, I just want to thank um, our guests today, Jonathan Innes and Todd Neal of, of AWS. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank us. you, yeah. And we want to thank AWS for sponsoring today's conversation. And we want to thank all of you. This has been Heather Joslin for the new stack, coming to you from the very noisy and lively floor at KubeCon plus Cloud Native Con, North America and Chicago. And we'll see you next time. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're on all the major social media platforms, 
You can always find us at thenewstack.io. We hope to see you soon.